Look, I don't want to think about it any more than you do, but the immigration system underwent radical changes during the Trump administration. It would be nice to think that everything that was broken was rebuilt in the first 10 months of the Joe Biden presidency. But that's just not true. Much of what was done under Trump is going to take years to undo. But more importantly, America is in the middle of a very volatile political period. What was seen in the Trump administration could come back. So one question that we have taken to asking ourselves whenever we do anything here at Frontier Tech Law is, how can we be ready for the worst that the US immigration system has to offer? In this video, I provide you with a partial answer. Here are 11 tips that you can use for any immigration form that you're filing with the USCIS, and you can probably apply these tips to any time you're interacting with the US immigration system. As always, if you like this, please subscribe, like, and share. I'll see you on the other side of the bump. Hi everybody, my name is Damien Noble. I'm the managing partner at Frontier Tech Law. You're watching Law Great. This is the channel where we give you reliable information to help you make better decisions and avoid costly mistakes on your immigration journey. Today, I'm giving you 11 tips that you can apply on any USCIS immigration form that you decide to turn in. But more importantly, you can probably apply this anytime you're dealing with the US immigration system. And remember, these tips are not just for today. This is for dealing with the immigration system at its worst. And I think that the volatile period of the Trump presidency that's continued into the present day is going to continue for some time into the future. So take this video as some wisdom that I'm passing on to you that I'm applying in my own practice. Tip number one, if filing in paper, check and recheck the addition date. And when you file them, file them with proof of validity. It became somewhat of a wonder to watch how quickly and needlessly the Trump administration, led by Stephen Miller, changed and rechanged the immigration forms uh, that Jacob Yoke found online and had to be filed with USCIS. Sometimes they seem to change weekly, and we were always having to follow updates from USCIS in case a form was changed in the middle of the night. We became very intimately acquainted with the fact that all forms have, from USCIS have two dates of consequence. One is in the top right corner, which tells you when the expiration date of a form is, and the other is on the bottom of the page, which tells you what edition the form is. The expiration date has no bearing on the forms whatsoever. You can't abide by it, so just learn to ignore it. The rule is you have to check the addition date, which is at the bottom of the page. And then you actually wanna check the USCIS page that that particular form you're looking at is hosted on and read what they say about what addition can be turned in when. And when you've done that, what you wanna do with your filing, if you're filing in paper, is actually include a copy of whatever that USCIS page says with your filing so that you can say, hey, this form should be accepted. I don't know how many times I've turned in a form during the Trump presidency that was supposed to be accepted because it was the correct edition date and it would be rejected with a claim saying that actually that edition date was no longer good even though at the time that we filed uh, what was up on the USCIS page that guidance indicated that we had correctly filed the form. So I'm not saying this is happening during the Joe Biden presidency, although I'm sure it could be, but from now on our rule is that we always file the edition proof of validity, so meaning we, we actually take out that web page from USCIS for that form with, with, with the form that we're filing. It's just what USCIS made us do. Okay, let's go on to tip number two. Tip number two, put in an index of evidence whenever you file anything with USCIS. I don't care if it's a request for evidence, I don't care if it's a rote I-130. I can't overstate how important an index is. What is an index? If you've ever looked at the index of a book, it's a list of things that you have filed with your application. 
So if you filed a passport copy, if you filed passport photos, if you filed a G28, if you filed a credit card authorization, if you filed a check, go ahead and list that on the index. Uh, there is a uh, 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 example here, right, alongside me, that hopefully the editor has put in, showing you what that might look like, okay? The reason that you want an index in there is because USCIS will send out requests for evidence asking for things that you have already sent in. They do it all the time. And so when you have an index, uh, you know, you can send back in your request for evidence reply, hey, here's the stuff you asked for. I'm just including the index to show you that I actually already filed it. Which segues well into point number three. Whenever you send anything to USCIS by paper, scan it, have a copy. Scan the tracking number label, scan your check, scan everything that's in your package. Again, during the Trump presidency, USCIS loved to do the thing where, they, uh, where they'd say, you didn't send X, Y, Z. It happened a lot because the packages we were having to send, especially with the public charge form, were so thick that it seemed like USCIS uh, would lose whatever we'd sent with a particular form because it would get stuffed in the package of another form sent in that application. So for example, we'd send evidence for an I-130, whoever was unpacking this giant package of stuff that included the 944, an affidavit of support, a 485 adjustment of status, they would put that supporting evidence in with another form and then send us an RFE for the form that no longer had evidence attached to it. Yes, infuriating, but that's just how it is. So from now on, the rule is, scan everything. Now we scan everything anyway. There was a tiny period during COVID when we weren't in the office where we didn't scan some stuff. And uh, I can't tell you how much I regretted that. You know, even though it didn't bite us in the butt in that particular instance, but go ahead and just make sure you scan anything you send to USCIS. And this way, as a bonus, you'll have a record of stuff you sent in and you might not even have to, you know, Freedom of Information Act for your A file, because you'll know what's in there. Very closely related, tip number four, and uh, don't use the USPS when you send stuff to USCIS. A lot of stuff you send is time sensitive. The USPS is run by a clown uh, in DeJoy, who has uh, intent of breaking down that uh, ages old institution. Benjamin Franklin is rolling over in his grave. Pragmatically speaking, this means that you as a filer with an immigration form that you're sending that's paper should only be using courier services. I like FedEx. Uh, FedEx still guarantees things. They can send things overnight if you get it in there early enough in a day. But more importantly, they just won't get lost. And USPS seems they lose things a lot. I haven't used them in several years. I know USCIS, however, uses them. And when they use USPS to send me things back for my clients, uh, they are late all the time now, especially in the past couple of years. So don't make things late on the way to USCIS at least, and do not use USPS. Tip number five, and again, this is the, you'll see a theme here. This is time sensitivity. I like the form G1450. This is the credit card authorization form. I think it's good in a lot of circumstances, but there are certain things it's not good for. For example, if you're an OPT student, you shouldn't pay for things with a G1450. I've dealt with nightmare cases of people have come into my office several times where they've tried to pay with the G1450 for an OPT extension or even an initial OPT grant and the credit card authorization doesn't go through and USCIS does not give them a chance to fix that application. They say you're, you know, your, your payment bounced, no matter the circumstances, your OPT is denied. So if you have a time sensitive application, uh, if you just need to get it in, go ahead and take the extra step of getting a cashier's check and, and sending that in and make sure that you're putting the right address on there, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. So my tip is if you have a time sensitive application, don't use the G1450, use a cashier's check. That being said, I like the G1450 for a lot of things, so don't think I'm saying that. All right, so all of this so far, the first five tips have been with paper applications, right? I mean, the, the Trump administration really waged war. They, they, they waged asymmetrical paper-based warfare against immigrants. And uh, a lot of what they did can be avoided by simply following tip number six. If you can, file online. 
Now I know I have a video floating around here somewhere saying, hey, the online system's bad. And that's because that video was from 2018. Since then, I think the USCIS online system has made great strides. And at the same time, the USCIS paper system has gotten so much worse, especially during the Trump administration. So tip number six is file online. I have a whole video on how you can create a USCIS My Account. Put it up here. I have a whole video on how you can uh, actually file an application on USCIS and the Department of State. You can check all those out. I am now a big proponent in a sharp switch of filing online because of all these issues that you run into uh, when filing paper forms, okay? Let me take a minute here. Guys, give me a thumbs up, subscribe. If you like this comment, all this helps. You know, it's been the quiet for the last few videos. Go ahead and let's make this video blow up. Please comment, give me a thumbs up. I know I'm telling you good stuff. You should do it, help me out. Tip number seven, now we're moving into the digital world now, okay? Sometimes you still have to use the USCIS hotline. Tip number seven is know how to get through to a live operator. In fact, I've made a whole video about that. If you wanna know the magic word, hint, it's InfoPass and how to use it, check out this video here. That's tip number seven. You need to know how to get through to a live operator. All right, tip number eight. So whether we're talking about online filing or paper filing, you need to be aware in 2021 where your form is getting processed, meaning what processing center. Depending on what state you're in and what form you're filing, you are going to be assigned a processing center, right? You're kind of pre-assigned one. Well, we are four or five years into the breakdown of the immigration filing system. COVID-19 made it worse. There are these tremendous backlogs uh, in processing centers the country over and in consulates the world over. And the immigration court system has a backlog of 1.4, 1.5 million cases. So let's just say we're backlogged everywhere. That means that your uh, application might get sent to a different processing center than the one that you're supposed to have if, if you look it up online. It happened to several of my clients in the past month. So you need to be aware of that because if your case gets moved from processing center that you're expecting to another one, your case time, what make time might go way up. You could get lucky and it could go down, but it might go way, way up. If you're filing online, this is one thing you need to be aware of. You know, you're not, you don't have a specific processing center that you go to if you file online, you're not guaranteed one. So you might get sent to one that where the wait time is really long. In my experience, however, those uh, processing centers that have long wait times, even if you get assigned that when you're online, you'll still sometimes, it, it seems like you still get a wait time that's closer to the processing center wait time you're supposed to be at. I don't know if, if that's a bug or a feature of online, but again, it's another reason why I kind of like online better than paper. It feels like they get dealt with faster. Tip number nine. Okay, so we've dealt with the paper side. I've told you, you know, filing online is really good. I've told you to avoid the USPS. I'm also telling you now that during the Trump administration, we got a whole bunch of new USCIS officers and they don't always know what they're looking at. So there's this increase in requests for evidence, which is due to a combination of uh, Stephen Miller and Gay uh, trying to figure out ways to turn down applications to make them take longer. Again, this sort of paper warfare but also they had new officers that were doing that. And the new officers sometimes just made mistakes. They just didn't know what they were doing. I'm seeing a lot more mistakes now and a lot less competence in USCIS in 2021 than I have in any other year. You shouldn't assume that the first person reviewing your application knows what they're looking at. If you get a request for evidence that asks you to send all these things you've already sent, well, you're not crazy. That's just happening more and more, unfortunately. So just be aware that the USCIS officers aren't the most experienced. And I wouldn't be surprised if there was an exodus both due to Trump and COVID, and if there's now a, a really tough job for whoever the recruiter is for USCIS to get that uh, get, get those units staffed back up, okay? So this segues into point number 10. For all forms, your post-filing game matters. What I mean by that is filing the application is often just the start. You're going to get the ball hit back at you by USCIS a lot more than you might have in the past. 
And you should expect requests for evidence, for example. You should expect interviews to be a little tougher. For whatever reason, that seems to be the trend. And so you need to know that going into an application, you're going to be interacting with somebody that you don't see who sends you letters. So what does this mean? Well, it means if you're filing on your own or you're filing with the help of a service like Boundless.com, you should be ready that either yourself or Boundless.com is not totally equipped to deal with the filing. Boundless doesn't deal with requests for evidence. You might not be ready to deal with one. And if you see something that's concerning and that you don't understand, you should ask for help. Okay, so this is where immigration lawyers are good. It's just like OBGYN doctors. You know, my that's that's uh, I have somebody I love very much is one of those, right? You know, there's about five percent of pregnancies, give or take, which are highly complicated, which were which are, what you want a doctor. You know, if you start bleeding out, you want a doctor, and you might say, well, ninety-five percent of pregnancies are uh, pretty safe, so I'm just I'm just not going to do a doctor. I'm just I'm going to do something different. I'm going to like. Uh, just let a nurse do it at my house, you know, or just let an unregistered midwife do it. No problem, 95%. Well, yeah, 95% of the time, maybe you're gonna be fine, but for that 5%, you really want somebody to help. The difference between childbirth and an immigration form is that uh, you have time when something goes wrong to, you know, find an immigration lawyer, you know? You don't have 20 minutes until you bleed out. You often have days, weeks, you know, months now with the COVID kind of slowdowns. Uh, and extensions for requests for evidence. So, you know, tip number 10 is simply, if there's a request for evidence, you need to know how to respond to it. Whenever you file something more generally, you need to have a post-filing game, and that's where calling somebody can really help. And so, I'm, I'm not, I'm not uh, this is tip number 11, and uh, I really like things like Rapid Visa and Boundless, which are now one company. Uh, I like them for people who can't afford assistance uh, from an attorney or an advocate that can, you know, prepare these forms for them because there's so many forms now, right? For even an adjustment of status application, there's so many forms. There's so much complexity. You essentially need and want form filling software that can cut down at a minimum, cut down on the mistakes you make on the forms, right? Instead of writing your name 10 different times, you write it once and it gets pre-populated. In our practice, surprise, we use form filling software that's designed for lawyers, shout out to Docketwise, but you yourself can do that without having to you know, hire a lawyer. So looking at, giving a hard look, right, to things like Boundless, Rapid Visa is, is, uh, is not a bad idea, okay? So form fillers are your friend. That's tip number 11. I don't want to hold that back because again, that's the channel where I give you reliable information to help you make better decisions and avoid costly mistakes, but also save money on your DIY journey. And so give those things a hard look, okay? So these are 11 tips coming out of the Trump era that I think apply to everything you do at USCIS. If you like this video, please let me know in the comments, subscribe, like, and uh, hang out. We put out a lot of videos. We started saying Monday to Friday how long the streak could be. It was 14 videos, right? That might be too much. Some weeks I'm gonna do three, some weeks I'm gonna do four, some weeks I'm gonna do five. But I'm gonna do them every week, several times a week. So check them out. We also do these uh, skits, which some people say are funny. You can check those out on our channel. They're in their own playlist. Thank you so much, and I uh, can't wait to put out another video.